Ah, ah. Hello, everybody. My name is Agustin Camacho. Thank you very much for attending our meeting. Probably all of you have already heard that climate change is bringing bad news for the survival of tropical species or even for species worldwide. Indeed, whenever a species meets a challenging environment, it will be less able to reproduce and further negative interactions like competitors, predators, diseases. However, there is a lot of fine variation, not only in, in environmental conditions, but also in physiological tolerance, and that variation needs to be understood. Uh, with that, we will be able to know where and which species will be actually badly impacted by climate change. So let me introduce our four talks today. First, Gabriela Montejo Kovacevic from Cambridge University will show the importance of microclimatic data sets and how variation in thermal tolerance and wind shape in butterflies helps understand their climatic vulnerability. Then, Paul Pintanel from Doñana's Biological Station will talk about how important it is to understand local variation in thermal tolerance and environmental temperatures to estimate the vulnerability of tropical tech poles. Maria Paniv, also from Doñana Biological Station, will present the results of her review on how climate impacts the demography of mammals across the world, with, uh, with some focus on tropical species, of course. Finally, I will show how dehydration affects the thermal tolerance of tropical forest lizards and impacts the geographic distribution of their respective climatic vulnerability. So thank you, thank you for the organizers, and we can proceed now with the talks. See you later. I'm going to talk about some of my PhD work on microclimate variability and butterfly thermal tolerance in the Andes. Ectotherms in the tropics, such as insects, are thought to have narrow thermal limits, potentially increasing their vulnerability to climate change. Because in the tropics, the climate is stable throughout the year, but it changes more rapidly across elevations, creating sharp transition zones. 
And with warming climates, many taxa have been recorded to somehow expand their elevational range upwards and habitat degradation in the lowlands, like it's happening in Borneo, is also accelerating this phenomenon. So it's becoming increasingly important to understand the potential of organisms to adapt to altitude, as well as to identify the traits that allow the colonization of these elevations. And a good approach to do this is to study taxa that inhabit large ranges, like Heliconius butterflies do. Some species are very widespread, whereas others are restricted to either the lowlands or the highlands. And in mountains, the physical environment changes a lot over a short space, which increases selection pressures. So given these differences, how can some species like Heliconia zarato happily inhabit this whole climb? Today, I've presented results from my PhD, where we tried to understand the climates experienced in the wild and identified phenotypes associated with thriving at high altitude, as well as discuss their vulnerability to climate change and potential future work. Rainforests are incredibly complex habitats, and these butterflies tend to cruise in and out of it, searching for flowers, host plants, or mates. So despite climate change being relatively constant throughout the year in the tropics, climatic variation within forests can be very large. And publicly available data sets are not ideal for, for understanding this variation, as they tend to be interpolated from weather stations like this one in Ecuador, which are specially designed to minimize the impacts of habitats on readings. So what we did was record temperature and humidity in 28 sites across both sides of the Ecuadorian Andes at high and low elevations. And we did this for a full year with 64 data loggers. Half were placed in the understory and the other half were placed in the sub canopy around 11 meters in height. And with this paired approach, we can really compare the temperature and humidity variation throughout the day in different parts of the forest that the butterflies actually use. So here I'm gonna show only a couple of results. First, how mean temperatures change throughout the day. And indeed, we did find that the lowlands here in pink are about five degrees hotter than the highlands. But the forest buffers temperatures a lot so that the understory is much cooler than the canopy, especially in the hotter parts of the day. Another physiologically relevant result is the range of temperatures experienced throughout the day. And we found that temperature range is higher in the lowlands and that the difference between the canopy and the understory is also stronger in the lowlands. However, if we had not gone through this effort of measuring microclimates in the wild, we might have got quite a different picture. So the stars here represent interpolations from World Clean 2. And as you can see, not only they are higher, which you might expect, but the trend is also the opposite, predicting the temperature range experienced throughout the day is higher in the highlands. So this highlights that to study small organisms, especially in the tropics and especially at high altitude, where there's a lot less data to interpolate from, we really need fine scale microclimate data. So how can these butterflies cope with this range of temperatures in the wild? I tested heat tolerance in the wild of 10 species that had a mix of elevational ranges. And for that, I measured the time it took for butterflies to get knocked out inside a chamber at 40 degrees. So in the y-axis is knockout time, the higher, the more heat tolerant the butterfly is, and the x-axis are different species or populations. And clearly butterflies collected in the lowlands are more tolerant to heat, as you would expect, even within the same species. But the difference is more striking when you compare the altitude specialist versus the low altitude specialist species that are in grey. What was quite shocking was that nearly half of the individuals of the three high altitude specialist species collapsed even before the chambers reached 39 degrees, hence all the zeros at the bottom, with temperatures as low as 35. And in our microclimate data, we had found that at least one, once a week, temperatures go over 30 degrees in the highlands. So these species must be behaviorally adapting to avoid these dangerously hot times of the day. Of course, with climate change increasing temperature extremes, this could be very concerning for these high altitude species. Another very important trait for thermoregulation in many insects is flight, as it's energetically very costly and understone selection to be optimized. So I wanted to look at wing shape and we photographed collections from around the range and extracted uh, wing area and aspect ratio. Aspect ratio gives you an idea of how elongated a wing is. So the higher it is, the longer the wings are. 
And what we found while controlling for phylogeny and other traits is that species inhabiting higher altitudes tend to have rounder wings, so lower aspect ratios. As I mentioned before, some species have wide ranges. So we're curious to know if wing shape also changes within species. And it turns out that they generally do. So in those species with wide ranges, high altitude populations tend to have rounder wings. And we think that it could help deal with the reduced air pressure by increasing lift during flight, but we haven't tested it. So the fact that we find for both traits, heat tolerance and wing shape varying with altitude within species indicates that they're potentially important at allowing them to cope with climate at high altitude. But to understand whether these traits were genetically fixed in a generation or plastic, we did some common garden rearing in Arato. So we collected fertilized female mothers from high and low altitude, brought them to a common environment, and then reared the caterpillars in the same conditions and in parallel to then test in the offspring, thermal tolerance, and any other relevant trait. So for wild Arato, we have already seen that the lowland individuals here in pink, um, have higher thermal tolerance. But if you bring the mothers to a common environment, their offspring are actually equally thermally tolerant, regardless of what altitude the mothers came from. So this indicates that this trait in the species is quite plastic. What about wing shape? Um, so here, the high altitude populations tend to have rounder wings at high altitude. But when we bring the mothers, the difference um, are maintained and even get stronger, su uh, suggesting that wing shape is at least partially genetic. And a larger study later revealed that wing shape is highly heritable in two species, making it a very interesting trait for adaptation to altitude that deserves uh, more study. So let's put these results into context. Um, it's clear to me that the habitat complexity in the tropics leads to large variation in microclimates within forests, but also large buffering potential across elevations. And that both of these patterns are very relevant for small organisms that live in such forests. So we should always include microclimates in vulnerability models. We have found that a widespread species has quite plastic heat tolerances, but the species with narrow ranges, at least in the wild, showed stronger differences in heat tolerance, making them potentially at more risk uh, from climate change. Finally, the ability to adapt genetically with traits such as those involved in flight might decrease vulnerability of species to climate. And a good approach to study that potential of tropical insects to adapt would be to look at cases of contemporary evolution um, through ongoing invasions, range expansions, or biocontrol introductions. And with that, I'd like to thank um, all my incredible uh, the collaborators and people that have um, helped make this um, project possible, and you for listening. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Paul Pintanel and I'm going to talk about the implications of microhabitat in amphibian evolution and their vulnerability to global warming. I am going to start with this slide. Uh, it has probably appeared in other presentations today, but I think it is important to show it here. To summarize, we know that most species richness, endemism and endangered species are concentrated in the tropics and especially in the mountainous areas. And one of the main factors proposed for those patterns is temperature. One of the most important papers within this area is this from Janssen. Janssen proposed that tropical species are thermal specialists because they are exposed to lower variation of temperatures compared to the seasonal climate in temperate areas. Therefore, species from tropical areas should be more limited moving to areas with different temperatures such as in elevation, but also in latitude, um, in comparison to temperate species. This hypothesis has been supported by many studies in terrestrial and freshwater ectotherms. Tropical species usually present narrower thermal breaths than temperate species. This increase in thermal tolerance breadth with latitude results from higher variation in cold tolerance at large geographical scales in comparison to heat tolerance. 
This pattern is known as the heat invariability hypothesis. While this pattern was initially proposed for latitudinal climbs, it has also been corroborated in elevational gradients. So, this idea of heat invariability has led to the prediction that species might have reduced evolutionary potential to respond to global warming. Finally, if species from the tropics are adapted to very stable climates, they will be more limited to moving to other regions with different temperatures. But they will also probably more, will be more affected by changes in time. Therefore, it is, it is expected that warming may have more detrimental effects in species in the tropics than in species from temperate areas. So, what we propose here is that a very important factor has been neglected in this hypothesis, which is the local variation in temperatures. We know that locally, temperatures might drastically vary across environments. Thus, daytime temperatures in open areas, such as grasslands, interracial habitats for adult frogs, or temporary prop, uh, ponds as uh, freshwater habitats for their, larva, for their larvae, for tadpoles, are more variable and reach higher extreme maximum temperatures than uh, habitats, forest habitats uh, in terrestrial habitats or streams in um, freshwater habitats. Therefore, we will expect that species from more variable habitats uh, will present broader thermal ra ranges than species restrict restricted to more stable habitats. However, we hypothesize that patterns of climatic variability at those uh, different climatic scales are dri driven by different thermal extremes. While latitudinal and elevational climatic variation are mainly driven by the cold during the winter or the cooling by the adi adiabatic lapse rate, at local scales, climatic variation in temperatures are driven mainly by thermal heterogeneity in, maxima te in maximum temperatures, afforded basically by daytime environments. However, nighttime environments are, quite, are probably quite um, homogeneous locally. Thus, the symmetry in thermal tolerance should show a scale-dependent relationship. So, what we propose here is that local scales uh, present higher variation of maximum environmental temperatures, which should promote higher variation in upper thermal tolerances, while at larger scales, higher variation of minimum temperature temperatures should promote higher variation in lower thermal tolerances in comparison to uh, upper thermal tolerances, as suggested as seen in the heat invariability hypothesis. So what we did is we measured the critical thermal maximum and critical thermal minimum, the heat and cold tolerance of a group of direct developing frogs of the genus Prisimantis in Ecuador. We categorized each frog as either a pond dwelling or a forest restricted species. And we measured also the temperatures of the habitats that they are distributed. What we found is that, as expected, minimum temperatures decrease almost perfectly with elevation, with habitat having no effect in its variation, in cold tolerance variation. However, while maximum temperatures also decreased with elevation, open habitats showed higher maximum temperatures than forest habitats and we found a correspondence with their thermal tolerance limits, with forest-restricted species uh, presenting lower heat tolerances than open dwelling species. So, what is interesting here is that if we did not consider habitat, we will not find a relationship of uh, heat tolerance with elevation. We will find this invariability hypothesis. However, when including habitat, we do found a relationship. So, heat tolerance is more variable or adap adaptable than expected. We found a similar pattern when we did similar experiments with tadpoles. So, what we found is that stream-restricted tadpoles uh, presented lower heat tolerances than pond-dwelling tadpoles. But someone can say that one swallow doesn't make summer. So, we decided to extract thermal tolerance data of a big database, the globe term database from different study, studies presenting both uh, critical thermal maxima and critical thermal minima for each species and for each study we used studies that uh, had at least five ectotherm species. 
from either terrestrial or freshwater habitats. For large geographic scales, we use studies that compre comprised a latitudinal separation of at least 20 absolute uh, degrees and or at least a difference of 2,000 meters in elevation. Uh, instead, for local geographical scales, we use studies limited to a specific region and with an elevation range not exceeding uh, 1,000 meters above the sea level. Uh, 1,000 meters. Here we show the variation um, value of matching metrics of heat and cold tolerance. However, I think uh, we can see this data bit better uh, here. So um, in this graph, we can see that uh, values below zero, uh, the dashed, dashed line, indicates that variation in cold tolerance is higher than the variation in heat tolerance, while values above this dashed line indicates that variation in heat tolerance is higher than variation in cold tolerance. Thus, most of the studies that are um, used for this analysis at large scale support um, the known heat invariability hypothesis. However, on the other hand, most of the studies at local scales do not support this heat invariability hypothesis. Thus, at local scales, microhabitat heterogeneity has a major impact in heat tolerance variation, but not in cold tolerance. Uh, ignoring or neglecting microclimatic variation is a main problem when predicting a species vulnerability to climate change. For instance, here we found that lowland prismatic species are expected to be more vulnerable to warming than highland species when we ignore um, these microclimatic temperatures. However, uh, when we include the microclimatic temperatures, we found that elevation has no effect on a species vulnerability to warming. Well, um, microclimatic heterogeneity has also an important effect on buffering extreme temperatures. For instance, here we show at the left the predicted vulnerability to warming using the current maximum environmental temperatures of each aquatic habitat where the species was found. At the right, we use the temperature of the most extreme aquatic habitats found in the area. Therefore, beyond the higher vulnerability expected, we found that, that stream restricted species will be more vulnerable than pond dwelling species contrary to what we expected in the first prediction. Similarly, we found a similar result with forest-restricted and open-dwelling prismantic species. Therefore, um, fragmentation and habitat destruction should be taken into account, since it may have more detrimental effects than climate change itself in tropical species. Therefore, conservation strategies should consider local spatial heterogeneity in physiological and environmental temperatures for the conservation. Um, well, first, I would like to thank the people I work with, and especially those that uh, have collaborated in the main project and uh, that I presented today. Uh, also, thank you to the research centers that have collaborated in these projects. And Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining our symposium and thank you Agus for having me on board. It's been quite a pleasure. This is the first time I'm attending the ATBC uh, conference and I would really like to thank the organizers for making this happen in such challenging times. So um, I will continue talking uh, about climate vulnerability and tropical ecoregions, but um, looking more closely at mammals. And I hope that by the end of the um, talk, I will have you convinced that we need, really, really need uh, more holistic approaches of how we assess um, demographic responses of mammals to um, climate change, especially in tropical ecoregions where we have huge knowledge gaps. And to convince you of these points, I will present research that um, I did uh, in collaboration with um, um, IDEF in Germany. Okay, but to give you some background, I think that it's quite um, established that there's more and more evidence showing that climate change affects natural populations in quite complex ways. And often this complexity stems from the fact that um, climate effects differ depending on the life cycle stage um, and uh, often interact uh, with other important drivers of, of demography, population dynamics, such as density, 
individual trade dynamics, uh, food availability, and so forth. One example are of the reindeer, which live in northern latitudes that are quite vulnerable to climate change. Uh, but uh, recent evidence shown, shows that actually more extreme climate events um, are likely to stabilize the reindeer populations because extreme events kill off vulnerable age classes, which decrease the density and therefore decrease food competition uh, for, for other ages. Another example of um, how complex climate change effects may be are uh, marmots, yellow belly marmots, which have been shown to adapt um, to recent climate change by increasing their body mass and thereby buffering from negative climate effects on, on, on the entire population. So the sort of complexity of population responses to the environment therefore occurs at the backdrop of um, demography or uh, by demography I mean the um, differential uh, survival and reproduction growth and migration and so forth of different life cycle stages or ages in the population and these differences um, are sort of a universal currency uh, when we look at uh, response to the environment, because these differences have allowed for the evolution of a wide range of life history strategies to deal with environmental perturbations. So much so that under uh, climate change, for instance, uh, when a given vital rate, for instance, survival um, is negatively affected, a population may actually um, shift uh, its strategy and adapt to increases reproduction so that um, the effects of climate at the population level may not be um, even so visible. So they don't affect population fitness. On the other hand, climate effects that um, synergistically affect several demographic rates may exacerbate extinction risk of a local population. But in either case, in order to understand um, um, how populations respond um, um, and, and or will respond on a changing climate, we need to look more holistically at the different life cycle stages and their demographic responses. Um, if we accept this premise, we need to look at the complexity. One thing that I always wanted to know is, well, how has this been done thus far in the literature? And to answer this question, uh, at, the, at, the, at the working group and, and IDEV, um, a lot of collaborators sat together and we looked through ecological literature that um, linked uh, various climatic drivers um, to various demographic rates across the life cycle um, of different uh, species. And we wanted to review these, these links um, and you know, what they show for all the tetrapods but because we had a lot of studies to go through, we focused on mammals. And this has been published now in the Journal of um, Animal Ecology, if you're more interested to look at the study you know, more broadly than what I'm able to discuss. Because uh, for the rest of the talk, I want to focus on uh, tropical ecoregions, not only because this is a uh, symposium and a, a conference on tropical ecoregions, but also because importantly, um, the tropics are a hotspot for mammal richness and of course, uh, species richness overall. They're a hotspot, but um, many of these mammals are also threatened due to um, human activities of, for instance, habitat degradation. And these threats are likely to be amplified on anthropogenic climate change. This current and potential future vulnerability has actually been uh, put on the map and quantified um, into um, ecoregional vulnerability scores by this wonderful uh, publication in 2011, where the authors looked at uh, the 200 most biodiverse ecoregions on the globe that you see here in pinkish and reddish color and they assessed their vulnerability to climate change, accounting also for the high biodiversity value these um, ecoregions have. And the red of the colors, the more vulnerable the ecoregions. Yes, and you can see already immediately that many of these highly vulnerable ecoregions are in the tropics. So this is the background. And on top of it, you see overlaying the results from our review on demographic responses of mammals to climate. And uh, you immediately see, um, so the, the dots represent, or the size of the dots represent um, how many um, dem demographic climate relationships were actually modeled um, for a given study. The first thing you see already that there aren't all that many studies, right? So we, we only uh, were able to find 
these holistic studies for 87 mammal species, so less than 1% of all mammals. And importantly, there are barely any studies in um, tropical ecoregions, yes? And this means um, if you look here on the insert, where again, you have vulnerability um, of ecoregion on, on the y-axis and distribution of studies um, as bars. Um, and here you see, so, so they're distributed based on how demography has been um, um, projected or has been linked uh, to, to climate, whether climate has a negative, positive or no effect on demography. But you see immediately that there aren't any studies in the most vulnerable ecoregions. And for the studies that are in sort of quite vulnerable ecoregions, uh, you, you, you get kind of the idea that, well, um, here it seems like um, demographic responses to climate um, are nil. So demography doesn't really, is not so vulnerable to climate. But this is because these studies have been done on primates who due to their social and um, behavioral complexity are considered buffered against climate change. So not a good representation, not a good representative samples of potential climate change effects on mammals. So um, to conclude, we sort of have very little idea of how uh, vulnerable uh, mammals are to climate change um, throughout their life cycle holistically um, in the most um, climate vulnerable ecoregions, which include most tropical ecoregions, or if not all tropical ecoregions. And this matters. This matters because, um, as I showed in the introduction and as our review confirmed, um, although um, one can look at single demographic rates, just so much, uh, for instance, survival and um, infer population dynamics from that demographic rate, in reality, demographic responses to climate are very uh, complicated, and this complexity remains across most species. So um, you see here by the bars, you don't need to worry about the color, just the distribution of the bars. And these are 11 examples that are representative of all the reviewed studies. And you see here responses per study in survival, reproduction, and growth. And whether you know these vital rates are projected to be negatively, um, not at all positively affected by climate, or context dependent, so depending on density feedbacks or interactions with other um, uh, drivers. And you see that you know, um, the responses are quite complicated. So only for, the, uh, for very few species do we have consistently the same um, direction of climate response across all vital rates. Typically, the direction differs as well as the effect size. And um, that means that um, because this complexity is prevalent and because this complexity may amplify or dampen um, climate vulnerability of species, we really need a holistic approach to collect more data and analyze this data for mammals and tropical ecoregions if we want to um, better conserve and manage the populations um, under increased, increased risks of climate change. And this has been successfully done for uh, many tropical plant species. Uh, where data on adult survival has been linked to recruitment, even if it's difficult to collect and put in open access data databases for better you know, uh, comparative studies. So I hope we can achieve this for mammals. And with that, um, I would like to thank you all for listening and uh, the entire working group for uh, giving me the chance to work on this uh, wonderful review. Thank you very much. Hello everyone and thank you for attending our symposium. In this talk, I am going to show you some of my recent advances in the integration of physiology and behavior for the estimation of climatic vulnerability in tropical lizards. As a rule of thumb, when an ectothermic animal such as an insect, a frog or a lizard performs a function, it will do it increasingly better as its body temperature its body temperatures rises from a critical thermal minimum temperature to an optimum temperature that maximizes the organism's performance. After that, at higher temperatures, it will, the performance will quickly decrease down to a critical thermal maximum that will block again the function and might rapidly kill the animal. For that reason, ectothermic animals exhibit voluntarily, therm voluntarily thermal maxima and minima that keep their body temperatures within adequate thermal ranges.
This is useful because one can compare now measures of thermal tolerance, like this curve, with the body temperatures measured for an animal or estimated for the future of global warming. In that way, one can tell whether a species is or will be exposed, exposed to unsuitable temperatures. From doing this calculation for species of different latitudes, the pattern arising is that tropical species might be at higher climatic risk than species of higher latitudes. Now, when ectothermic organisms are acutely to increasingly higher temperature, the probability of survival also decreases exponentially. In addition, this probability of survival might decrease too when they are exposed to lower temperatures but for longer time. As a result, locally, populations of ectotherms track microhabitats with suitable in temperatures. In this example, we studied the distribution of environmental temperatures at a gradient from a the semi deciduous forest to an adjacent scrub savanna in the only known region occupied by this little endemic lizard of northeastern Brazil. There, we found the only places occupied by these lizards were the ones that very rarely exceeded their voluntary thermal maximum. Even though this oversampling sites will be sometimes a few meters away from each other. Now, this reasoning at larger geographic scales, let's say across the whole Amazon basin. With the proper tools, we can also estimate the number of sites where available temperatures will rise over the thermal tolerance of an organism for how much time along the year this will happen or the proportion of a species known locations that are exposed to too hot temperatures. Cool, right? there are complicating factors, and one is water availability. In this meta-analysis of 1,900 species of animals and plants, Johanna Brady and Brian Leung in 2016 found that water availability, either in form of precipitation or distance to water, are as important or more than temperature in driving a species geographic distribution. How do they interact with each other in tropical regions? If we think of a tropical rainforest, we can visualize that, in addition to the strong sun radiation able to cook any organism, there is also so much clouds, so many clouds, and also vegetation cover, and also a lot of water available in form of precipitation, watersheds, and a lot of evaporated water. The presence of all humidity has a lot of thermal inertia. The thermal oscillations of, the, of the, the oscillations of air temperatures within narrow thermal ranges. In higher tropical environments, such as a savanna, even though vegetation can still provide shade, the lesser amount of water available means that sun radiation is invested into raising environmental temperatures instead of evaporating water. To understand all that, my students, Carolina Molina Guevara, Cleverson de Sousa Lima, uh, are interested in developing systems to measure the, the thermal tolerance of different types of organisms and understand how they vary due to dehydration and other factors. This the voluntary thermal maximum is a faster and more ethical measure of thermal tolerance for animals, and so far it seems thermal tolerance decreases with uh, dehydration and the voluntary thermal tolerance too, meaning that animals become more thermally conservative as they become dehydrated. Now, the new results I'm going to show you try to answer the following question. Does hydration level affect lizards' VDMAX and vulnerability patterns within the Amazon basin? I joined a zoological inventory across the Rio Negro in northern Brazil. We studied the voluntary thermal maximum of Loxophoris percarinatum, a very small lizard with one gram in total weight that lives in one of the most water buffered habitats among terrestrial ecosystems. The voluntary thermal maximum is very simple. One puts the animal to rest in a chamber where it feels safe and will remain quiet. Then one heats it up homogeneously until the animal leaves the chamber. When that happens, one can record the body temperature using a thermal camera. Because these measures vary from individual to individual, I measure the VT max of each lizard for three times. One in 30 hours of collection, 
then again after dehydrating the animal overnight, and then I will remeasure it after a process of rehydration of 24 hours. I did that for 19 specimens, and will, I will always wake the animals right before the measurement of the VT max to, new, to know if the treatments actually work. Fortunately, they did. Our treatments were able to dehydrate and rehydrate the lizards, and what we found is that the VT max would increase with hydration level as expected. Now, to see if the voluntary thermal maximum will be exceeded by environmental temperatures across the Amazon, we use one of the most sophisticated biophysical modeling algorithms out there. The RNH mapper implemented in our language by Michael Kearney and Warren Porten in 2016 is able to use heat and water transfer equations to estimate year-round body temperatures for a body of a given size and shape at a given location. I repeated these calculations for thousands of locations within the Amazon Basin. Now, this algorithm uses many parameters and thus its outcome is going to vary according to any of them. For, because of that, to evaluate the relative importance of dehydration on the resultant patterns of expected vulnerability, what I did was to create maps of vulnerability comparing all possible combinations of six factor, each one with two levels. These were the change in body weight related to the dehydration process, the change in, in VT max due to the dehydration process, a change in, uh, in, in, a hal in halving the current rainfall, the current amount of rainfall, and a total decrease in the water surface available for uh, evaporation. I will change also the tree cover from 100% to 800%, which is, among the, is, is around the range that is observed for, for these lizards, for these loxopholis. And I also will allow the animal to bury at, down to 10 centimeters below the leaf layer. By making all these factors to vary, I generated a lot of models of the temperature of the of vulnerability at which uh, with these lizards will uh, be exposed to different levels of temperature. In that way, I could compare the changes in use by each of these factors. From factors, what I found is that the voluntary thermal maximum, the amount of tree cover, and the amount of rainfall will be the most important factors. Between them, the changes in voluntary thermal factor, in voluntary, in voluntary thermal maximum, will have an order of magnitude more importance for the three measures of vulnerability that I use. The amount of locations with exceedingly high temperatures, the, the amount of yearly time with exceedingly high temperatures, and the amount and the proportion of uh, populations with exceedingly high temperature. The take home messages now are that, or resultant from this study, are that dehydration alters the thermal tolerance and the geography of expected vulnerability that knowing geographic patterns in climatic vulnerability requires hard to get physiological data and that changes in tree cover and rainfall need to be watched in the Amazon. And that is all for now. Thank you very much. I want to thank especially to Miguel Trefort for being the coordinator of the final inventory, to Diana Brunes with whom I had the pleasure to prepare and execute the project, and the Herpetology Lab group from the Biosciences Institute of Sao Paulo University. I want to thank also the Sao Paulo Research Foundation for paying the study the CAPES and Marie Curie program for paying my bills at the time of the study and now respectively. Thank you to all very much and see you in the discussion section. Bye bye. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Um, I think you can all see me, right? Yes, is it working, Agustin? Yes. Good, okay. Uh, okay, so yes, um, I am Maria. Um, I just gave a talk and I am here to um, do the Q&As. I want to remind everyone that while I'm answering the ones that just came in, so I will answer the ones that came in through, um, the, through Zoom first, um, so that, you know, because otherwise you will not be able to see them. Um, after the session has stopped, and then I will go over some of the ones that are on the app. 
And please feel free um, to keep posting questions, especially um, after the session is over, feel free to go on the, on the app and uh, post any questions you may have to us. Okay, so um, I do have a first question from Ruben Sagar, and I do hope I'm not butchering the name. <laughs> and the question is actually for me. Um, it goes, um, I do not study mammals, but from my little experience in tropical forests, most mammals are highly elusive, which I presume would make studying that demographics extremely difficult. Um, and um, Ruben would like to know um, my thoughts on how this issue can be uh, tackled. Uh, well, I think um, so from, from my experience in other systems is that uh, one important step uh, would be to put up camera traps, for instance, um, to first investigate where and um, you know, the, the sort of the, the abundance, the local abundance of uh, the species of interest or the community of interest. Um, and then um, it, there are, in fact, there are some species that can be individually identified from camera uh, trap data. Um, and uh, even elusive species ultimately can be studied through capture recapture analysis. Um, it's just, I think more than anything, it requires a long-term commitment. Um, it requires funding agencies to commit to long-term projects um, that do not give immediate returns, right? Within uh, the first two or three years of the study because you need to collect and process the data. Um, but um, I think this has been a, a common um, theme um, lately and in this uh, conference so far um, as well is that we do need these long-term data sets to be able to understand um, how species respond or the mechanisms of how species respond to climate change. So yes, um, it's it's sort of a, a sort of, I, I, would, I would say like a um, change in our funding schemes would definitely help there. Yes. Um, the second question is for Gabriela. And um, it is from Bart uh, Meischer. So uh, Bart is asking, oh, so first he's thanking us all for the talks. And he's asking Gabriela, in your study to quantify the thermal tolerance of butterflies, you use the knockout time of 40 degrees Celsius. While most studies in this field usually use critical thermal maximum instead. Would you argue that the knockout time is a better measure are the results of CT max and thermal knockout comparable? And do they inform us about the same thing? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that that's a great question. Um, the reason why I chose um, kind of heat knockdown initially was actually uh, logistical. So um, it is easier to maintain um, a temperature um, at 40 degrees while in the wild. And I was very interested, interested in measuring uh, this trait um, on the same day as the butterflies were collected so that you know, there wasn't um, time for acclimation. Um, so we, we couldn't ramp up temperatures. Um, but I do think there's also, um, you know, they're slightly measuring um, different things. Um, and my hope was that um, with thermal tolerance, we might get a better idea of, um, well, how well different species can cope with a potentially realistic uh, temperature uh, and for how long and might give us an indication of, you know, when they will start behaviorally responding to, to, the, to the heat. Um, so yeah, I think they're very, um, they're quite different. There's one paper um, in functional ecology uh, looking at how the two compare in Drosophila. Um, and to be honest, we don't know anything about um, CT max in, in Heliconius. So, it would be really interesting um, uh, to know more. Okay, um, thank you, Gabriela. Now I have another, is there another question coming in? Yes, there's a, well, first I will go with a question for Paul. And if you have time, I will address the next question. And that question was, let me open the web. Um, so, the question goes, Paul, so thank you again um, for the presentation. And the question is, as ecophysiologists, we tend to quantify warning, warming tolerance, but vulnerability is composed of other two traits, uh, which, uh, so exposure and sensitivity, which you showed. How do you think that conservation practitioners may take advantage of our ecophysiological knowledge to identify vulnerable species of populations? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, 
I think this is a more difficult question than it seems. Um, I think that um, maybe our, our data provides like uh, a trend, like uh, our trend, we found that, for instance, uh, any uh, change in, in habitat use can be very detrimental for the species. So, so it gives us, and especially for river restricted species or forest restricted species, so it gives like um, information, a general information about uh, trends about some group of species that can be used for um, future initiatives. However, I don't think this data can be used specifically for one species like CityMax is, uh, is um, like everyone measures it uh, in different ways. So some people use uh, different um, rates of increasing the temperature. Uh, for instance, Gabriela uses the knockout. So uh, it helps in a big perspective in like uh, trends within different species. But I don't think that uh, with only this data, uh, you can give like a, a good information about the specific species, I think. I don't know, maybe Agus have, have more to say about that. Uh, uh, quite on the opposite. I, I I pretty much agree with you. I will only I will only try to to try and generalize and try to add the the geographic perspective of of trying to uh, identify on which within uh, like thinking of a species not only as a population or a, or a, or a couple of populations across a small climb, but thinking of a species as a, as a spot a be a really big geographic spot in the earth on the earth in which it's going to have uh, several types of, of populations and these populations they're going to show several different types of responses to climate change because depending on how the the conditions relate to their physiology so i think that that one one key one key question one key point to relate uh, to relate thermal tolerance and the things that we we measure right thermal tolerance environmental temperatures is to to think in a in a geographic dimension and try to to see well where where is this going to be really relevant for the for the for the fate of this population or of this species right and think of that in that in that dimension i think that that's the only thing that will add yes i agree with with you sorry <laughs> no no okay no no thank you guys um i have a next question from uh actually from dave Kling, Klingus. Uh, he actually has uh, two questions, a follow up. But anyway, uh, so this question is for all of us, uh, but probably not me because I don't work with thermal uh, uh, traits. So for the, the rest of you guys, and it goes, um, thermal ecologists measure a variety of thermal traits or parameters uh, of uh, a TPC. So the uh, T-PREF, TC-MAX, TC-MIN, knockout time, tolerance, breath, and so forth, right? For understanding field conditions, as opposed to lab controlled settings best, what thermal traits do you think we ought to prioritize? What do you think, guys? Whoever would like to go. We, we use very different traits in our, in our different talks, right? I, I thought it was cool, but, but it also creates this confusion, like, OK, what do we use, right? Yeah, I think it's really tricky because it feels that mm, CT Max and CT Min is very much about the physiology and, and the extremes, you know, the, the breadth of uh, temperatures that it could ever experience. Uh, but for someone more like field uh, minded or I don't know, for me, sometimes um, I, I like more to think about realistic temperatures that um, they might encounter. Um, and, and I don't know whether that's a, a better test um, or whether really if the uh, thermal limits correspond very well to, with, um, you know, their kind of normal um, fitness um, limits, then, then I guess both would be fine. Um, but yeah, I think um, th there's just so much to do in any given taxa to, to know how these relate. I have, I have just, the, I think that any, any of these, any of these traits might give you interesting information about the field conditions, but the, the difficult thing will be to identify which of these uh, field conditions this trade will tell you about. For example, the critical thermal maximum might tell you 
a temperature that will kill the animal, even if it's uh, hidden in its own microhabitat, right? Or a temperature that might kill the animal as he passes through uh, an exposed rock or something like that. But then uh, other temperatures like voluntary thermal minimum might, will tell, might, might tell you uh, which, is the, uh, which is the temperatures over which the animal can be active, for example, right? So it can tell you together with the voluntary thermal maximum restrictions on the time that the animal can be active in its environment. So for these different, for these different, uh, these different measurements and for whatever you're going to study, you're going to need different also different protocols, different laboratory protocols. For example, if you're, you're going to measure, you want to know what's going to happen with some spe species in one place at one certain time, you might want, you might want some fresh measurements from the field. In other case, you might want to, to take a, to, you know, to develop a, a common garden experiments like the, the one that Gabriela did, right? So, okay, thank you. Um, I want, so kind of, they've had a, a follow up to this actually, and it's kind of something that was in my mind as well. So Dave was also wondering, okay, so um, what is the best trait to use in order to generalize across systems uh, to understand climate vulnerability? And that sort of relates to my own um, question, as I am someone who, you know, who, who looks more like population ecology in general, and I'm always trying to assess demographic vulnerability to climate, where often we do not have the type of mi microclimatic information that you guys uh, uh, importantly focus on, right? So how can we generalize um, in dealing with a typical lack of data that we are um, confronted with often? Do you want to say I'm oh. oh, sorry. Uh, I also okay. wanted to add that some of those also depends on what you want to see or what you want to work with. Like, for example, the, uh, the opt uh, optimum temperature normally is used for like long term exposure to a temperature, like it's vulnerability for a long term exposure, while knockout or city max are more for a short term exposure to temperatures. So also what you want to see if a uh, heat wave have a strong effect on, on an organism or a species, or if a constant increase of temperatures, like a constant uh, higher temperature is um, more like detrimental for the, the species, the population or whatever. In order to generalize, I, I just have the opinion that, that whichever whichever trait that you have measured for mo for as many species as possible. I think it's mo much more important that you have it measured in a, in, in, in a comparable way in as many species as possible than, than anything else, actually. Okay. I have another question. I have another question for Maria before we go. Because yes. I was, it was very interesting for me to, to see in your, in, your, in your talk that the different impacts of the climate of climate change could be either positive or negative and even for for tropical mammals they didn't seem to be absolutely in danger or imperiled by by climate change in in, in ectotechnic animals for, with which i i'm more familiar uh, this is kind of a of a paradigm we we have found that that the thermal tolerance or different thermal parameters of of uh, ectotechnic animals seem to be more close to their limits uh, more close to the temperatures that the that the environment offers so they seem to be more in danger in in the tropics what have you seen any any demographic study on an ectothermic animals would you have any any idea on why this could be different for mammals or something like that um ectotherms are generally um, not just in the tropics they everywhere more sensitive to climate because uh, because they are because due to their physiology right that's that's a given so um and um, i think uh, many uh, your talks have um, given the clues to why that is, right? Why they are, why they are more, more uh, um, sensitive to climate in the tropics. And in end of terms of like, you know, for, for mammals that we, that we talk about, I mean, what kills mammals is land use change, really. I mean, it's the, that, that's, the, that's the killer of mammals in the tropics. Um, and um, uh, the, the issue with climate change is that it may create an edit, um, an added effect um, that may exacerbate the sort of effects of human of human pressures already. Um, I don't. Um, there are, and that's the thing. There just um, aren't that many studies, um, holistic studies um, across any species, 
And the point is that animals um, are have quite amazing abilities to buffer environmental change, right? So even for a lizard, um, if survival is um, threatened, they may decrease their body size, um, they may reproduce more. So in the end, the population may persist. And we need to understand these types of buffering mechanisms. Uh -huh. And I think we're almost done, guys. Sorry. So. Yeah, I think we have only two minutes. So one minute. Would, <laughs> one minute. I would like to finish with a couple of with a couple of conclusions from the from this from this short symposium. I wanted to stress that Maria shared with us uh, that the assessment of climatic impact needs to be done at different parts of the life cycle, and that the the outcome can be quite heterogeneous. And that Gabriela Montejo Kovacevic and Paul Pitanel show us that show with us that hey, heat and cool tolerance might respond to microhabitat and altitudinal gradients in tropical organisms. And also that as I showed with, uh, with Gabriela, heat tolerance and thermoregulatory behavior can be quite plastic in tropical organisms. So this means that we are gonna, I think that as ecophysiologists, we are gonna need to, to keep measuring this data, uh, ecophysiological data on, on organisms, on tropical organisms, in order to understand this plasticity in order to adapt this plasticity to geographic models of species vulnerability. And I think that is all. Thank you very much to everything, to everybody, and to all the people that wanted to, to attend. And, and see you soon, I hope. Yes, and please ask us more questions on the app. Uh, we are we're here, uh, or contact us. And thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.